Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on this rainy, rainy, cold, windy day. I give you lots of kudos and credit for being here. It was, I'm sure, not so great walking in, but I'm very happy that you're here. Um, and so welcome. I'm Bridget Gibbons, Director of Economic Development for Winchester County. Welcome to the first uh, Clean Energy Careers Job and Resource Fair here in Westchester. We're so excited about Uh, it was such a big day for us. We've been working very hard on it, and I'm just delighted that it's it's all falling into place. Um, as many of you may know, clean energy is a priority sector uh, for Westchester County, based on you know, our direction from County Executive George Latimer. What does that mean to be a priority sector? What it means is that we focus our human resources and our financial resources on growing that sector. And what we determine based on our research is that our employers, our, our solution providers in Westchester, they need more trained workers. So we really put about um, putting together plans to get more re Westchester County residents trained to work in clean energy careers, which allows our clean energy solution pro providers to do more clean energy solutions in Westchester, and therefore helping our our you know our environment and our reducing our our footprint. So it's a win-win-win from our perspective to, to really focus on clean energy and getting uh, people working in, in, in that sector. I wanted to thank our hosts uh, here at Pace uh, University. We're delighted that we were able to have this great facility uh, to, to have this event. I, I want to recognize Peter McCard, who's our Director of uh, Energy Conservation and Sustainability. He's gonna be speaking in a moment. Um, and I just want to turn you to our program book. So you'll find that we have a few things planned. After this, we will be having our uh, keynote speaker, who is Radina Velova from IREC. Um, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. That'll be followed by a panel that's focused on training. So what do, if, you're, if you're in middle school or high school or a young adult thinking about a career in clean energy, what do you need to do to get started? You know, what, what are the different opportunities to get trained? either just a certificate program or a degree program. So there's a lot of opportunity. And what we want to do is help youth understand how to get started. It also, the second panel then is focused on hiring opportunities. So maybe for more seasoned uh, workers, um, what jobs are available? What's, you know, what's the pay? What kind of skills do you need? What training do you need? What skills might you have that are transferable to uh, that you might be working in a different sector and you have some good skills that would be applicable to clean energy. So we're excited about those panels, um, and and you can see, read all about them in the locations in the program guide. Uh, this event came together with a lot of hard work from a lot of people. I wanna thank our Clean Energy Careers Working Group, many of whom are here today that have guided us as we put together today's uh, events. And I also want to thank, of course, uh, Sustainable Westchester. The team at Sustainable Westchester has been critically important to uh, helping get this program um, where it is today. So. Now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Rachel Carpertello, who's the Director of Programs for Sustainable Westchester. Thank you, Bridget. It is truly a pleasure to have such visionary leaders to partner with here in Westchester County. I'm Rachel Carpertello, a Program Director with Sustainable Westchester, a municipally-led shared service that delivers climate solutions to governments, municipalities, businesses, organizations, and the people of Westchester County. Through our innovative programming, extensive relationships, and effective advocacy, Sustainable Westchester has been at the forefront of the regional and statewide transition to our clean energy economy. We conserve natural resources, promote environmental justice, and help member communities become more prosperous, healthy, resilient, and equitable. Our team comprises brilliant sustainability leaders who once set their sights on a career in clean energy. It's my honor to thank Yasmin Najjar, Hannah Myron, and Armando Twitter for their dedication to organizing today's event and improving our world. Industry leaders, Fisher Energy Partners, and Con Edison are today's platinum sponsors. Without their support, this event would not be possible. Each of the sponsors that you, oh, let me go to the slide. Each 
Each of the sponsors that you see displayed in this image is leading the transition to a clean energy economy, and we couldn't be prouder to have their support. You'll be able to connect with many of them about employment and training opportunities in the tutor room at 430. Finally, thank you to New Yorkers for Clean Power, Pace University, and Westchester County for your partnership in this event. Without further ado, I'd like to bring out Peter McCart, the Rapid G Conservation Fund for Sweden. Thank you, Rachel. It's nice to see a lot of fresh faces. I don't, we, we tend to speak to the choir a lot. And we need to get outside of that, and I'm, I'm excited to see so many fresh faces here. Uh, as you can surmise from this very event uh, brought together by Bridget and, and Rachel and, and their, their economic development team and Sustainable Westchester, um, uh, the county is working on all fronts towards uh, the necessary uh, goals of New York State's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, bolstering our energy portfolio with renewable energy, electrifying our fleets and buildings, and working on efficiencies and conservation are important. We are getting this done by the proficient work of the men and women who work for the county, the ones that have their hands on the on the dials and the switches and the uh, spreadsheets. Um, and the tools, uh, but it only gets done by having a leader that says, make it so. It's my honor and pleasure to get to introduce our county executive, George Latimer, who is making it so and getting actual beneficial outcomes for the good people of Westchester. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, and it's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm, I'm happy to be here as part of this partnership uh, between government and the private sector being hosted by uh, Pace University, Pace Law School, uh, the cooperation with Sustainable Westchester, and so many other individuals and organizations, and it does take all of those resources to come together to make a, a, a positive direction. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have here members of our team. You just saw Peter McCartan. Uh, who's our director in this area of public policy, and Richard Gibbons, who's uh, director of our economic development team. Let me point out our deputy county executive, Kent Jenkins, is with us here. Kent? Yep. We also have Tom Kleiner, who's executive director of uh, our joint workforce development board that we work with. Yep. With El Forzan Pineda, who works on the economic development team with Bridget, and in her own right, is a member of the Yonko City Council. So we're fortunate to have those situations. I learned a long time ago in my private sector experience, my background was in sales and marketing, that if you wanna be successful, you need a team of people that have skills that complement yours. And whatever I might have in terms of skills, I learned a long time ago, you have to have somebody very bright in law, somebody very bright in finance, someone who understands the operational realities of whatever your entity is. And you have to be able to bring those people together and keep them engaged and motivated and that is what today's uh, projects are in economic development. Deb Novick, I see, is also with us here. My uh, eyesight always needs a little bit to be uh, desired. But uh, it's important to understand that it is the combination of those resources together, human resources of individuals and talent and drive, that helps make these things possible. When I was, I've often said this before, so if you've heard me say it, I apologize for repeating it. When I was a young boy growing up in, uh, in Westchester County, I grew up in the southern part of the county, before there was a 287 and a 684, what economic development was in this county was attracted major U.S. corporations based in Manhattan to relocate out to the suburbs because of the quality of life, the open land, and so forth. IBM, PepsiCo, uh, Nestle, a number of those major companies made those moves back in the 60s and the 70s, and it, it created a concept that economic development was about that. That's changed. So many things have changed in the society. And in fact, as I, as I think back on things, what bigger change happened than when the combustion engine was created? All of the blacksmiths in the world who were accustomed to shoeing horses and having transportation uh, that was horsepower transitioned into what we know now as the automotive industry, which has its issues that we now have to deal with in terms of the environment. But how many blacksmiths bemoaned the change and said, what am I going to do? My career is disappearing in front of me. The old, you know, you yell at one of the old early original cars and yell, get a horse, because that was uh, uh, such a, a change in direction. 
but change constantly happens. I remember when I was uh, at, in, in my corporate career, and I was sitting at a desk in the mid-1990s, and something came across my desk that said www.worldwideweb. And I turned to a person in the office and said, what is that? So no, we found out what that is, what the internet represents. And so many different changes have come. And now as we get on the cusp of what artificial intelligence may mean to our world, economic development, and, and how do we take something that's brand new, understand it, and harness it. And that's exactly where we are with clean energy, with uh, renewable energy in a way that we haven't seen before. In some ways, you go back to the very founding of our, um, uh, of our country, and renewable energy were alongside the rivers where there were rapids, and you were able to harness the, the action on the river and turn it into hydropower, which gave us original source of uh, electricity and uh, the growth of the economy, which is why New York is in a harbor, Boston is in a harbor, and, and other cities up and down the country. But this is now a new frontier, and it's a frontier that we also have learned. We have to uh, figure out how to make it economically viable, because people in a, uh, in a capitalistic society move for those things that they want because it, it embellishes their economic structure. It is affordable for that, and therefore they embrace it. And it is not just government alone that can mandate the change in consumer use of things. It has to come organically from within. I could not have predicted a few years ago how by the line would become the new trend. And a generation or two below my generation rose up on that as an automatic way of purchasing as opposed to bricks and mortar stores as we knew them the other generation. So the question for our society is, will we, will we understand change, will we accept it, and will we lean into it to make it work for us? And to some extent, there are people that resist the change. There is a, uh, uh, you know, clearly a, a fossil fuel industry, oil and gas industry that is profound, it's significant, and it generates profit and, and money that, that feels that it's not ready to get rid of the, uh, the horseshoeing of uh, the forces and moving into an era where there's a combustion engine. And that's what we face again today. Whether we will show the political leadership to do those things or not would probably play out long after my time in the arena. But it's important for us now and have conferences like this and, and, and things like this where we look to the future of where jobs will come. Tom Roach runs a dynamic city in White Plains that has stayed on the cutting edge of the future. And we compliment White Plains, and I think most of the rest of the communities look at White Plains as having been able to do that. That's what we must do. That's why we're here today. And I'm very happy that our government is, is actively uh, coordinating, cooperating with all partners. So next, I want to introduce uh, our, the uh, head of Sustainable Westchester. I've known him over an extended period of time. He has had a public uh, career of great substance as a, a councilman and mayor of the city of New Rochelle. He's taken those skills now into uh, a new venue where there's a great opportunity to move forward. And uh, we're very happy to continue our partnership in this fashion. No reps. Mr. Brown. Just outrageous that the county executive would highlight White Plains instead of Nerve Shell. So I don't know. I don't know he said about that. And, he to get all that. Uh, and I, I listened very carefully to Deepa Park's introduction. I loved him saying, "Make it so." And of course, being a super nerd, I immediately think of Charles Luke Picard. Uh, I don't know how many. Well, no, no one else know the Star Trek fans. What a smatter, smatter. So, so Jordan is not um, gallivanting around the galaxy, facing down the board, uh, but he is an extraordinary leader. Westchester County, and we can be so fortunate uh, that we have someone who's committed not only to the programmatic and service offerings of the county, which is the foundation of the job, but to using the county government as an instrument for, for lifting up lives. And that really is what this event in, is all about. So I want to thank you, George, for your great leadership. And of course, that is executed by local partners like Bridget Gibbons, who has been our day-to-day -day, uh, liaison and, and this wonderful effort and so many others. Um, so I thank you, Bridget, and, and the entire county team. I want to thank our hosts at Pace, President Krislov. It's great to be with you. Uh, I think we all understand that this is an institution that's not simply a, an ivory tower in the distance, but is committed to making a real on-the-ground difference to our communities and to our region. We appreciate that so very much. And I'm glad that Rachel recognize the whole Sustainable Westchester team. It's all hands on deck for us today. 
Uh, so lots of our colleagues are with us today. Thank you for, for recognizing uh, Pam and Yasmin and, and, and Mona. Uh, and let's give a big round of applause to Rachel, who has been our leader. Thank you. So uh, I this is really a very significant event. And it's significant in a micro sense and in a macro sense. What do I mean? In a micro sense. I, I know many of you are here as individuals looking to secure career opportunities, to chart a, a new path in your professional life. And that is thrilling. You're doing yourselves a service. You're doing a service to your families, to your communities. That's meaningful. And some others here, I'm sure, are employers looking to find talent that will help you do your work. And that's meaningful as well. Those are reasons enough to be here. And yet, in a macro sense, we're also doing our little part to confront the challenge of our time. I mean, many of you may have heard the, the true statistic that the summer of 2023 was the hottest in the last 100 years. Correct. And yet, that's the wrong way to look at it. Because the summer of 2023 was also the coolest of the next 100 years. We are submitting our children and our grandchildren to an unprecedented experiment. A swifter change in the climate than has existed in the geological history of this world, dating back tens of millions of years. And all this happening to a civilization that is built on foundation of climatic stability. And so if we're going to have any chance at all of meeting this challenge, it has to be through what Jordan mentioned a moment ago, a whole scale shift to clean renewable energy. And that shift has to be fast, and it has to be just. And so workforce development is at the very part of both of those adjectives. We can't do it quickly unless there are people ready to take jobs in weatherization and electrification and standing up new renewable sources of energy and standing up new transmission lines. We need people to fill those jobs in order to move at the pace we go on. And just unless we're all sharing the benefits, unless the civilization that comes out on the other side is one that is equitable and inclusive, then we really will not have done our jobs. So I thank all of you for being here. I congratulate you on being here. And I hope that you will find this entire afternoon to be warning and thrilling and positive in terms of knowing that we can take agency in making our communities a more world better place. Thank you all very much. And it is my pleasure to introduce our host, President Marvin Krislov. Okay. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Elizabeth Haupt School of Law at Pace University. How many of you, this is your first time here? Wow, that is so great. This should not be your last time here. So we are very proud of our law school. We are rated the number one in environmental law in the country. We have, among other things, a great uh, Pace Clean Energy Center. We also have Land Use Law Center, and we have a lot of programs dealing with law and policy. And one of the things that we really are proud of is our focus on both the local, the regional, the state, the national, and the international aspects of the challenges that Noam and George Latimer just talked about. Um, so I'm very proud to be here. I want to recognize some of my colleagues, Dean Anderson, who I think is in the back. There's Dean Anderson um, of the, the law school. And I want to say thank you to all our faculty and staff who are here. And for those of you who are thinking about exploring your educational journey, whether as college students, whether as graduate students, whether as law students, please uh, make sure to, to explore all the opportunities that we offer at PACE. Um, we thank our partners at the Westchester County Office of Economic Development and the um, Sustainable Westchester and Executive Director Noam Branson and the New Yorkers for Clean Energy. We are very committed to being part of this important gathering, but more, more even significant, continuing to do the work. Um, I think what, what George and Noam and the other speakers have talked about is that this is not just a one-day problem. This is not just even a one-year problem. This is the problem, the challenge, the opportunity of our future, and we are very proud to be part of that. We have been engaged in this work for 
50 years, and uh, we are here to continue to be part of the solution. So thank you for joining us, and welcome to the law school, and welcome to Pace University. You all are welcome to come back on many, many occasions and to be part of our community here. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Krislav. Now that we've heard such inspiring words from our municipal, academic, and nonprofit leadership, let's turn our attention to the voices of employers through a quick video produced by New Yorkers for Clean Power. As we accelerate the transition to clean energy, New York State will add over 200,000 new jobs to the economy by 2030. Half of those jobs are in the built streets. That's things like heat pumps, weatherization, energy efficiency, all stuff that you can do without having to have a ton of experience to get started. So these jobs are open to any. In order to get this transition right, we're going to need to include everyone. That means that we need to have space in the building trades for women, for people of color, for people who have been incarcerated, for people who have disabilities. All of us need to work together if we're going to get this transition right. And that means that everyone needs access to these good quality jobs that sustain the, the benefits are all the different tracks that are available. So if you are interested in the technology or the design behind how buildings are more efficient, then there's also the track of hands-on. So you know, the, any determined upgrades or anything in, um, that is in the design phase, you could be the one that implements it physically. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a career path that I took in marketing. There's also advocacy. There's also community outreach. So there's a lot of different paths that you can take and a lot of opportunities for you to grow. That I'm very low, and I'm really managing. When a multimedia uh, program working in two counties, I mean, doing this type of work. But we think what's happening with oil and gas, other price that big going, going up. So, so they are making more focus on trying to make it really more of a thing. The big change that we have now in, in, in this whole approach to electrification, uh, how we're trying to make it make more energy conscious, so we can then include the global warming that, that we know that we generate because of what we start, the, the, the fuel that we are burning. The big size of the change that's really occurring now is the climate legislation, both in New York State and on the federal level, and the incentives that are coming along with those things are really encouraging folks to make these longer-term investments in like education. We all need workers, and those are terrific paint jobs. You start out at a, at a high level, and you can move up rather quickly. You have a lot of opportunity in the company you close to start with, and then you have a broad opportunity beyond that. That's what's so amazing in this industry is that the careers that people have, they're, they're higher paying jobs, they're long lasting jobs, and it's just everyone that's in it for the right motives. We're in it to help people change the way their homes are powered and help this new economy that we have in New York of this green economy. And right now it's just growing at a rapid pace. Solar year over year is just developing at rates that we've never seen it before. I'm asking everyone, so I please understand the help that we need in different communities in the state of New York pertaining to these trades. By creating jobs, by venture, by teaching, we can fix these problems. Mm -hmm. 
And I'd like to acknowledge Cal Truman, who's in the room. You're going to hear from Cal a little bit later as a part of the panel. Oh, no, we're getting the other for new power. Yeah, yeah. And they are leading the Clean Energy Careers Partnership across the state. So we're really lucky to have him as a partner and leader in this effort. Um, so with, oh, I won't go into that. Um, but there are so many exciting things happening in the industry today. I'm not sure how you'll choose which path to pursue. And that's why we brought together the keynote speaker that we have today in the panels for you later. So let's learn more about these opportunities from our keynote speaker, Radina Belova. As vice president of IREX regulatory program, Radina provides strategic direction and oversight of IREX regulatory team Radina has more than 10 years of experience in energy and climate law and policy, focusing on electric and gas utility sectors, utility transformation, and a just transition to a decarbonized economy for underserved and disadvantaged communities. Before joining IRAC, Radina served as Senior Staff Attorney and Regulatory Affairs Manager for the Pace Energy and Climate Center in, here in White Plains. Uh, where she led the center's engagement in New York's reforming the energy vision, developed policy solutions for decarbonizing the building sector, and pushed for clean and affordable energy for low and moderate income communities. Radina is a graduate of the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law here at Pace University with a JD certificates in environmental and international law and an LLM in land use and sustainable development. Thank you so much, Rachel. And it's so great to be here with all of you. I actually just recently moved back to White Plains after spending a couple of years in Denver, Colorado. And it's amazing being back at Pace. The last time um, I was here for an event, um, Rachel and I were reminiscing was the day before everything shut down for COVID. So it's kind of a perfect circle being back here and being able to spend this time with all of you talking about New York's clean energy future and how we're going to implement it through the clean energy workforce. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to the amazing faculty and staff at Pace. I literally would not be here today without the amazing professors I had who were my mentors and my guides and helped push me in the direction of working in the energy field and to Pace Energy and Climate Center, where I learned a lot of what I will know today. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the clean energy workforce broadly. We're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like in New York, what's happening here. And then we'll talk about some of the policy drivers that are creating the need for the clean energy workforce. First, a little bit about IREC. Uh, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council is a national nonprofit organization that focuses on building the foundation for the clean energy and energy efficiency to benefit people, the economy, and our planet. And we do this through three programs. One is our workforce program, through which we focus on growing a diverse, qualified, and equitable clean energy workforce through strategies that unite stakeholders. So one of our primary roles is as a convener of conversations like this to develop a consensus-based solutions in order to improve the workforce growth through every step, all the way from recruitment to job placement. We also have a local initiatives program, which works with municipalities like cities and towns to help them grow clean energy, address climate change and create new jobs. An example there, if you're interested in learning more, we have amazing colleagues in Puerto Rico who develop community-based microgrids. Um, that is their home, they live and work there, um, focused on resilience um, in order to help communities navigate the energy challenges that are unique to the island. And that is the only instance in which IREC engages in developing projects. Everything else is uh, based on developing policy and creating solutions. And the regulatory program, which I head up, uh, focuses on working to uh, smooth the process of integrating renewable energy and energy storage into the grid in a way that uh, recognizes interconnection equity. You may be wondering what is interconnection equity? We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation and to uh, grow distributed energy resources um, for rapid decarbonization. 
So what is the clean energy workforce and why is it crucial? Why are we here to talk about it today? And some of our speakers have already mentioned why it is so important, but I want to get into some of the, some of the details. Um, first, a snapshot of what types of careers or jobs could be covered within the rubric of the clean energy workforce. You have on the developer side, uh, whether it's solar, storage, wind, or other resources, you have installers. You have uh, people working on the marketing side, marketing and sales. You have attorneys who help with the contracting. You have you have electricians um, and many other positions just within that one uh, sector from the industry. You also have the building sector, uh, uh, construction and retrofitting across the different types of uh, buildings, residential to industrial. There is building operations and facility management. So more um, opportunities within the building sector. And there are also uh, a lot of career options for architects, for engineers, policy specialists, and uh, lawyers. I know, you know, there's that uh, quote, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I'm a lawyer. I can talk a lot about the jobs of level in that field in particular. I have less expertise to speak about the other jobs. Um, and by the way, I am standing in today for my colleague who is the head of IRX workforce program. She's an absolutely amazing clean energy workforce professional. So there, there are any questions that I can't answer for you today, I can take them back to harm. So this is just a very small snapshot of the wide variety of jobs that are available in the clean energy workforce. Some of them require a four-year degree or higher. Others do not require a college degree. Some require specific certifications. Others require other certifications or no certifications. And I believe Cal is going to be talking about this later today in their panel, um, what jobs require what different types of uh, certifications or degrees. So you can navigate those questions. A um, really huge variety of choices. In terms of what the market looks like, the most data that we have nationally relates to the solar market. We have less data for wind and uh, energy storage, for example, and other uh, clean energy sources. It's just because the most amount of research and surveying has been done for, for the solar market. So that will be the market that you'll hear the most about today. The takeaway here is that most of the jobs in the solar market in 2021 and 2022, which is the year for which we have the most recent data, are in the installer sector. So there are more installers out there um, than any other job type within this market. And uh, obviously there's other uh, other jobs there, but I, I want to stick with the installer focus for just a second and jump here uh, to some of the challenges that folks within the clean energy market are facing with hiring. There is a really huge gap right now between the uh, number of jobs that are open and, and the number of companies that are hiring and the number of job seekers that are available to fill those positions. Huge gap. And installers and project development, that's the second line item, faces the biggest hurdle. So installers represent the largest number of uh, employees within the clean energy sector and also um, are, represent the biggest gap of the number of people that we need to fill positions. Um, and this is based on a survey, again, as you can tell, also focused exclusively on the solar workforce in which we asked, is it very difficult, somewhat difficult, or not at all difficult for you as a company to fill positions? And as you can see, very small percentages indicated that it's not at all difficult. Um, about 90% said it is at least very or somewhat difficult. So the bad news is that employers are having a hard time filling positions. The good news is that there are a ton of jobs available in this sector, and that is only going to increase. The clean energy transition and the just transition, now to pause in a moment to talk about what we mean between clean energy and just transition, cannot happen without the clean energy workforce. All of the policies that are coming down from the federal level or from states or from municipalities of requiring certain programs to be developed ultimately wind up being projects on the ground. If New York State, for example, says we want to reach 100% electricity for renewable resources by 2040, that represents solar projects and wind projects and energy storage projects being implemented. Someone has to be available to develop and design and implement those projects. So the clean energy and just transition literally cannot happen without the people to make it happen. And 
I mentioned we're already facing constraints with hiring because there's a gap between the number of positions open and the number of people ready to fill them. That's only going to grow. What it is estimated that we need 400,000 more jobs, more workers per year over the next 12 years in order to achieve nationwide our clean energy and climate goals. Um, and that is an estimation that's based on the amount of clean energy we anticipate will be deployed based on state and federal policy. So we're already a little bit behind in terms of creating that pipeline of workers, and we're really going to have to pick up the pace. And as I mentioned the last bullet here, many employers are facing hiring challenges um, due to the need for growth within and in the workforce. I'm going to pause here for a second and, and talk about the difference between the clean energy transition and the just transition, because they are not the same thing. Uh, no one mentioned uh, just transition earlier. The clean energy transition, when we talk about that, we're really talking about numbers. What percentage of your energy comes from uh, solar or wind or uh, a combination thereof and storage or geothermal energy, so on and so forth. It's really about the numbers. Just transition, it's a much more broad concept that includes energy democracy, that includes energy equity. And it's asking how can we redistribute power and resources and wealth in order to achieve energy equity and energy democracy. So it's a question of redistributing power and redistributing wealth so that the people making the decisions about energy governance are the communities being impacted by, by those decisions and that we have uh, democratic decision making both from, all the way from the community level to the public service commissions and beyond and uh, determining uh, who is being negatively impacted by the existing energy system. Um, we have a lot of frontline communities um, who may be located or may have had power plants uh, located within their communities without their consent, who are suffering directly from the negative health impacts of those power plants, for example. How do we stop making those decisions and give communities the power to choose their own energy future? So uh, related but separate concepts and both, both very important. The clean energy workforce in New York specifically is growing um, much faster than um, in other parts of the country. I think New York is a leader in this respect. And uh, by the end of 2022, this is the year for which we got the most recent data, New York State reached a record of 171,000 workers, which is its highest number ever. And uh, those workers represent uh, these four general areas in renewable generation, grid modernization and energy storage, transportation and buildings and energy efficiency. So across all of these sectors, we've seen this big growth. This growth outpaces both overall states' economic growth as well as overall job growth. So the clean energy sector in New York is outpacing the overall state economy and the growth in jobs statewide. And the good news is that the New York State Energy Development, uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority has committed $170 million to continue workforce development and training. So we anticipate that this growth will continue uh, and needs to continue. From IREX perspective, we view the clean energy workforce as not just about the numbers. It's not just about how many jobs are out there and how many people need to fill those jobs. We take a holistic view of making sure that we have a highly trained and inclusive clean energy workforce that empowers both individuals and communities. So we look at not just how will this one job impact the individual who's stepping into that role, but how will that impact their community at large? And how will the growth in jobs and the kinds of jobs and the people who are finding their way to those jobs create a broader benefit within the communities? Um, and I want to share some resources that we have available. Um, you feel free to take the QR code, or if anyone's interested, I have my contact information at the end. I can send you links. Um, the Green Workforce Connect is a platform for connecting job seekers with employers, specifically for uh, the uh, Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program, which helps uh, qualifying low-income customers uh, access weatherization services to make their homes more energy efficient. And so if you're interested in that career path, this is a hub where you can go to both find out all about the different training options for you to enter this field, as well as connect directly with employers. We also publish three career maps. There's one for solar, and you see a snapshot of it here, one for HVAC, and uh, one for green buildings. 
And if you were to go to the website and click on either one of those um, white dots or in the left hand of the screen, the drop down menu, it would show you a list of all the different types of jobs that fall under each category. So under manufacturing, you would see a list of here are all the types of jobs in manufacturing. If you were to click on a job, it would then tell you this is the average salary range for this type of job. This is the number of years of experience that employers typically look for. These are the types of credentials or degrees you need for this position. And also very importantly, it shows you what the advancement possibilities for that type of position are. So if you were to enter the solar field, for example, as an installer, the career map would tell you, if you enter as an installer, here are your opportunities for promotions and advancement so that you can make an informed decision if you're entering the field about what your career might look like, not just in the next two to three years while you're in this particular job, but long term. And lastly, um, this is, uh, I found out after I created these slides, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not the workforce expert, uh, particularly that this data from 2019 is a little bit outdated. We do have our recent data from 2022. If anyone is interested, I'm happy to share it with you. It comes from the 2022 solar job census. Um, the data is a little bit outdated in 2022, but unfortunately, we are not seeing the uh, increase in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility that we would like to see in the industry. This is an area in which I am sad to say and ashamed to say that I think the clean energy sector is falling behind. Uh, for example, from the 2019 um, diversity study, which still carries through to any day, a lot of people find jobs through uh, their existing networks and connections. And you're talking about a field that is still predominantly white and male. And if those are most of the people that you know, it is unlikely that the study found that um, black uh, individuals, for example, have a much harder time finding their way into these positions. Because again, it's kind of a closed room in a sense. There's no accessibility to these jobs because people are making their way to the positions through networking as opposed to broader means. And that's why we established uh, programs like Re Workforce Connect to break those barriers and make the positions open and uh, known to and accessible to um, a much broader audience. The other thing to note here is that um, among the bad news, there's also some good news. Uh, there's, uh, I should also note, there's a lack of gender diversity in the industry. There are some trend lines of improvement but it's very, very slow improvement. Um, the positive side of things is that um, there are some really great uh, things happening in relation to veterans. Um, there, uh, the Department of Energy also runs the Solar Ready Veterans Program. And um, in terms of percentages, there are more veterans employed in the solar industry than there are employed in the overall national economy. So I do think as an industry, we are doing well with outreach and recruitment with uh, that particular uh, sector. I couldn't tell you exactly why that is. If anyone is interested in exploring further, I'm happy to connect you with my colleagues at the Solar Ready Veterans Program. Um, but that is, I think, a nice opportunity to highlight the fact that if we wanted to do better, we could do better. So again, I just kind of want to point the finger at the industry and say we're not doing well enough with DEI in general, and that's something that we really need to work. And now I'm going to stop the focus on the workforce and transition over to talking about the policy side. As we mentioned earlier, everything that the workforce does is to implement the higher level policies and consumer demand for clean energy resources. So it's very important, I think, to understand where the workforce growth is coming from and what it is resulting in, what uh, folks who are taking on these positions are doing and contributing to. Um, I think we've already mentioned today the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is New York's foundational law that mandates the direction of the state's uh, climate and just transition and clean energy future. So I put the word goals in the first bullet. It's actually mandates. These are legally binding requirements that the state has to meet. One of them is to uh, have 100% clean and carbon-free electricity by 2050. There are also greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements and many, many subcomponents of that that we will need to get into right now. A very important provision is that at least 35% of the benefits of clean energy funding have to go to disadvantaged communities 
disadvantaged communities is a legal term that is defined under the law, and the state is undertaking mapping exercises in order to determine where those communities are physically located within the state in order to be able to achieve this goal. And this builds upon many years uh, previously of a lot of work that the state has done um, in the clean energy transition. The issue I'd like to spotlight today has to do with how we integrate renewable energy and energy storage on the grid. Uh, any solar panel that you see on a rooftop, any large solar farm that you see, any wind farm has to be connected to the grid. And that happens through uh, a sometimes quite intensive process, sometimes quite easy if you have a smaller project through which you submit an application to your local utility to what's called interconnect your system with the electric grid. And uh, this is incredibly important uh, because distributed energy resources are one of the key elements of the clean energy transition. Uh, the other one is large scale energy. So there's, there's two different systems that we can think about. One is large scale, which is like the big power plants and the enormous wind farms and the enormous solar farms and all the big transmission lines. Like if you're driving down the highway, those huge poles and wires, that's that's transmission infrastructure. That's a very important and essential part of the clean energy transition of just our energy system as a whole. Distributed energy resources like local solar and storage have their own unique benefits that that larger energy can't provide. For example, I mentioned earlier IREC's work in Puerto Rico on building community-based microgrids. They're building those microgrids because when the larger grid goes down as a result of a hurricane, those communities will be able to restore power much more quickly and continue to, you know, be able to cook and, uh, you know, pull their homes in the summer or, you know, have cell phone service and, and so on and so forth. There is a resilience benefit. Um, there are benefits in terms of customer savings, in terms of reducing your electricity bill um, and uh, many others to the individual customer. There's also benefits to the grid. It takes a lot of money to build the big infrastructure. It can be a lot more cost effective to have uh, many more renewable resources dispersed throughout the communities, uh, whether it's on residential buildings or commercial buildings. It reduces the overall cost of serving our energy needs. And this is an example of what that cost reduction can look like. This is from a 2021 study by a research firm called Vibrant Clean Energy that showed if you combine large scale resources with distributed energy resources, you can save up to $515 billion by 2050. That is a whopping amount. Meaning, if we're not maximizing the amount of local solar and storage, we are missing out on these savings. And if you ask me, that is irresponsible, that is fiscally irresponsible, that's irresponsible to the communities and to the people who would benefit from these resources. It could also reduce in significant reductions in our rates and create more jobs than if you only had or if you prioritized just large-scale energy. So lots of opportunities to save, and this is why distributed energy resources are so important. How we get inter uh, distributed energy resources connected to the grid is through a process called interconnection. And interconnection rules are found in the Public Service Commission. That's the regulatory agency that governs utilities rules. So they're found in the commission's rules and each utility adopts those and applies them. And so interconnection serves as the rules of the road for connecting things like solar and storage with the electric grid in a way that allows them to operate safely and reliably. A utility's primary responsibility is to ensure safe and reliable service at just and reasonable rates. Interconnection rules allow us to put rooftop solar on our roofs and do so in a way that does not mess with the grid at large. This is the... Uh, process snapshots. If you were a developer, you would begin with the prospecting stage to find good land for your project, to get the necessary permits. If you're an individual residential uh, homeowner, you probably wouldn't go through this stage. You already know where your panels are going to go on the old roof. But everyone has to go through the application process. You submit an application. There is a process of review for the utility to determine whether or not your project is going to have negative impacts on the grid and then you hopefully will get to an agreement phase. The reason I'm going into detail with this is because on the next slide, we'll start talking about how we move away from this onerous and very lengthy and sometimes very costly process. 
if we're talking about getting to 100% clean energy future, and that relies on having a lot more local solar and storage, we have to make the process of bringing those assets to the grid much faster than we do right now. Right now, if you submit an interconnection application in some states, even if you have a small project that's just a rooftop solar as opposed to like a big solar farm, it could take you months to make it through the process. And in some cases, you could be required to pay $15,000, $20,000 to upgrade the grid in order to avoid any grid impacts for New York system. I think from what I hear, New York is doing pretty well with interconnection compared to other states, but no place has it uh, perfectly. So this is one of the primary barriers to achieving all of the clean energy goals we've been talking about today. And that's why it's so important that we talk about how we get this right. I'm gonna move on now to what is the solution? One of the solutions obviously is to get these procedures right, to have well-designed interconnection rules so that from the moment you submit your application to the moment you have a signed agreement, it's an efficient process for both the utility and for you as a customer. The other solution is what's highlighted here, what's called proactive hosting capacity planning. As I said earlier, one of the utilities or the utility's core obligation is to ensure the grid is operating safely and reliably and to integrate renewables with the grid if a customer wants to install solar or storage. One way we can do that is instead of evaluating every single project that wishes to interconnect one at a time and then investing in those grid upgrades that may be required, the utility can prepare the grid for renewables in advance. So if you're a solar customer, let's say you have a house or you live in a multi-family building and you get together with others and say, we want to put solar on a multi-family building rooftop. Right now, you'd have to submit your application for interconnection. And let's say the utility comes back to you and says, you can interconnect, but you have to pay us $50,000 for a transformer upgrade, let's say. That might just kill your project. You might not be able to move forward at all. Imagine this alternative step where the utility is already upgraded that part of the grid so that it is ready for your project. So you don't have to pay that at $50,000. That is what we're talking about here in terms of proactive and hosting capacity planning. Hosting capacity, I know it sounds like it's, it may be not a term that you're familiar with. It may sound kind of complicated, but at its simplest form, it's the amount of additional clean energy like solar and storage that the grid can accommodate. It's basically how much additional clean energy can the grid host without having these expensive grid upgrades. So the proactive hosting capacity planning process is simply the process of the utility preparing the grid for your clean energy system, your neighbor's clean energy system, your local business's clean energy system before you choose to interconnect so that you can avoid paying the full cost of those upgrades. It doesn't mean you'll, you'll pay nothing. You may have to pay a portion of that, but it'll be significantly less than that $50,000. And I'm happy to share that New York is moving in this direction. They're doing a lot of work at the Public Service Commission to get this right. And uh, this includes this coordinated grid planning process. We don't have to spend any time on details. The point is lots of work is being done um, to figure all of this out. So I know that was a lot of wonky energy stuff encapsulated in a very short amount of time. If there is one takeaway I think I would love for you all to walk away with, it's that we have to have a mix of both large scale resources and local solar and storage in order to save the amount of money we're going to be spending on the clean energy transition. We also need to support the jobs that are going to get these projects implemented. And we need creative solutions like this kind of proactive upgrading of the grid in order to get there faster and more cost efficiently. I will stop there. We can take a question from the audience. If there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Yes. So, parents are depressed. Parents are um, if the the checks that we have replaced and the only building is to get the product to be made at a surface. The micro question is describing how exactly do they uh, get in? How exactly do they get in? And it's individual retailers. 
Bill, it's all over my own. Where does it get? How does that happen? I think it's Google separate. Yeah, that's a great question. Microgrids are pretty incredible resources. They have existed for a long time. This is not a new technology. Um, you may have read in the news, I, I don't know, during Hurricane Sandy, so this was like, what, like more than 10 years ago at this point, um, New York University has a microgrid running on its campus, and it was serving as a location where people could go like power their phones, for example, um, during during that time. And it was able to keep running because, you know, when the power uh, went out in that area of Khan Edison's territory because they had a microgrid. So not new technology. Um, the way that it operates is um, it, it can operate in two ways. One is more technically challenging than the other. It can either run in parallel with the existing electric grid, which is easier for the utility to accept because, again, their job is to ensure that the grid uh, remains safe and reliable. Any technology that could potentially mess with that, they look on with uh, scrutiny and concern. So if you wanted to operate your microgrid, um, let's let's say you have a bank of solar panels and uh, an energy storage system. Um, you might also have a diesel generator for backup. Like microgrids can be a number of different resources combined. It's not all renewable. I see the, the look of surprise on your face. It's not necessarily a renewable resource. Um, it, it could also have some gas. It could also have some geothermal. You could have all of these systems combined serving more than one customer. And, uh, you know, it can get pretty complicated. Um, it, it could be uh, a university and a hospital or a hospital and some homes, uh, many, many different configurations. But the point is you have the opportunity, if it's designed in this way, to run even if the grid goes down using a variety of different local um, energy sources. And that is as far as my knowledge goes. Anything beyond that, I can refer you to my engineering colleagues. I'm sorry. It's that was a fantastic answer. So thank you so much. And everyone, you can feel free to reach out to Radina. There's her contact information. She's very generously, um, you know, looking forward to hearing from um, some of you. So that is welcome. Good afternoon. Now we'll begin our first panel discussion on clean energy training opportunity. It is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator to this panel, Tom Rabinan. Tom has been <laughs> They're so excited to have you here. Tom has been the executive director of the Westchester Program Workforce Development Board since 2018. He is responsible for directing all aspects of the workforce development and career center system, including program development, staffing, operations, budgeting, and fiscal management. Tom partners with multiple agencies and business partners to identify the hiring needs and optimize this opportunity for job seekers in Westchester and Putnam County. Previously, he was the Hudson Valley Regional Representative for the New York State Department of Labor and Deputy Director of the Mid Hudson Regional Economic Development Council. Prior to that, Tom was a seven term town supervisor in Orange Town, Morocco. Please join me in welcoming Tom and all the training panelists to the firm. <laughs> I'll sit next to Dwight. Thanks very much. And it's uh it's great to be here. It's really great for all of you to be here. We how about a round of applause for all of you that have come out and braved this weather, we really appreciate it. I'm the director of the Westchester Button Workforce Board, and there are at least three members of the board um, who are were here. Uh, the president of PACE, uh, Marvin Krislov, um, Tracy Rasikut from Southern Westchester Bosses, and Bridget Gibbons, uh, who you heard from earlier, the economic direct, uh, development director for Westchester County. And we also have staff who uh, are here or, or will be at the job fair. Liz Oliveto is our youth liaison. Uh, Bob, uh, Nishan, uh, Tracy, and Joe are also here and will be able to assist uh, job seekers. And, and just a question, uh, how many of you in the audience are employers? And how many are here who are currently job seekers looking for opportunities, a terrific, right? And there'll be those opportunities. Um, 
So in the in the keynote, it was mentioned that there are 400,000 clean energy jobs that are possibly available. In a recent uh, workshop, uh, or workforce development uh, uh, conference that I went to with workforce developers uh, around the uh, country, the numbers that they shared are really startling. For the three major um, federal initiatives, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Infrastructure Act, the estimates are 800 million workforce development um, and trading funding dollars for the Infrastructure Act with 7.5 million jobs forecast over the next 10 years, um, 200 million and 9 million jobs in the Inflation Reduction Act, and 200 million funding at 280,000 in the CHIPS uh, in the chip set. Um, so there's a lot of floating numbers around, but the one thing I think we can confidently say is that there are tremendous opportunities, both for employment, both for employers, um, not-for-profits, government uh, opportunities for us to be able to share these resources. Um, and the the one thing, and Cal mentioned this, Cal will uh, moderate the next panel, talked about the barriers to employment. Um, there are many opportunities, but there are also many uh, with barriers to employment. There are many who don't have any particular barriers, um, but aren't sure exactly how to enter into the workforce development system and take uh, the opportunity to get some of these green energy and renewable uh, energy jobs. Um, so what our panel is going to try to do is to identify some of those training opportunities and the different paths that people can take to access those, those uh, jobs. And then the following panel will talk about some of the existing opportunities, the actual employment opportunities now. And of course, they're both interrelated. Uh, you need to train to get the jobs. The, job, the, the employers need to be able to access those who have a proper training. It's all an integrated system. And that's why I just want to say one thing about this conference and what Sustainable Westchester is doing with the county. Um, all of these things are, are really uh, require partnerships between business, between uh, government agencies, between educational institutions like uh, PACE and others. Uh, Mike Robitas here from the uh, Westchester County Association, the Business Council. All these organizations need to figure out how we can pool our resources together uh, to be able to to make this work. And the final thing by way of introduction, I'll just say, as part of this conference, one of the uh, keynote speakers said, you know, in 1900, the amount of time it took for knowledge to replicate itself was 100 years. By 1950, it was 50 years. By 2024, now, it's 12 hours. I mean, just think about those, those uh, differences in the replication of knowledge. It's, it's astounding. And clean energy and clean renewable energy, of course, is the thing that's changing even faster than that, as our panel I think explained. So thank you very much for listening to me and now let me introduce No to some but wearing the same tie as it was when the spirit of state. It's true. Um so uh, first, Dwayne Norris, who's a CEO of Soulful Synergy, um, who um, works on systematic issues that address disadvantaged communities by providing transformational services designed to improve the lives and create long-term sustainable uh, development, uh, among other things, many other things. He'll explain things. Um, uh, Julie... Um, Taglioni is currently the Director of Continuing Ed here at PACE um, since 2022 and has held uh, other related positions over her uh, career, was a graduate of Oneonta State University with a BA in Education. Uh, Marvin, next to Julie, Marvin Church, is the co-founder and acting Associate Director of Environmental Leaders of Color, an organization devoted to advocating and educating communities, particularly socially and economically about um, climate change, impact, mitigation, and solutions. He has had several decades of experience working in government, clean energy, and related fields. And finally, Erlian uh, Castillo uh, from the IBEW Local 3. Um, 
So I was an associate director at the uh, Joint Industry Board of the Electrical uh, Industry and Educational and Cultural Trust Fund since 2022 um, and related activities. So we have a great panel. I think when, when we were discussing this um, before uh, coming here today, we thought that the training opportunities um, are, are both for the general public. We had some uh, members of the uh, Guidance Center from Mount Vernon, young people who I think went out to the job fair, um, and others who uh, are more on the youth side of the equation and more just for the general public. So what we'll try to do is uh, break that up into two pieces, one um, for just general information about opportunities that are available and the challenges with regard to training, and then we'll, we'll come back to the panel and talk about um, more specifically the youth opportunities. So uh, first, Dwayne, just uh, if you could explain a little bit about Soulful Synergy and its mission and and uh, what you do. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Mike is on? Yep. Awesome. Um, so yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. My name is Dwayne Norris, co-founder of Soulful Synergy. I'm business partner in the back, Alejandro. Um, and so essentially what we do is prepare people for where we see the future of work. And I think the conversation this morning as you attend all these conferences, you'll hear the same conversation. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and not everybody trained to do it. Um, and so we provide certification-based trainings as well as hands-on trainings for the trades, green construction. So things like OSHA, scaffold, flagger, CPR, fire guard, things that people would need to work um, in the construction industry, but also paired with hands-on skills in construction, such as carpentry, electrical, plumbing, um, things that would allow them to do installation of some of these new technology areas. Uh, we also run in partnership with Con Edison, a program focused on energy efficiency for buildings. So more looking at energy auditing principles. So performing level one, level two ASHRAE audits on systems like lighting, HVAC, uh, boilers, um, building envelope, other things so that you can assess where the inefficiencies are, document those, and ultimately leverage uh, some of the Con Edison and NYSERDA incentives to upgrade those buildings, retrofit them into more, again, efficient technologies, lower costs, but also lower carbon emissions. Um, we run programming focused on uh, electric vehicles. So looking at universities like this that have tons of parking structure. Uh, where should they put their uh, charging stations? How many do they need? Do they need level one, two, or three? Um, and doing site feasibility and assessments for those. Um, and then in New Jersey, ultimately what we're doing here in New York, we're doing training focused on offshore wind, as we understand that that is going to be a huge sector for New Jersey, New York as well, but just across the country, even onshore wind is going to be a significant form of energy production. And when you look at the trends of where jobs are going, the wind industry is going to be a, a huge um, need. So, um, you know, what we are essentially looking at doing is preparing people for, again, the future of work. And it requires a little bit of everybody. It requires people who have, you know, outreach and communication skills, sales skills. It requires people that have hands-on skills, installation skills, inspection skills, data skills, a lot of uh, data collection through these processes, um, a lot of project management that's needed. Uh, even working with your municipalities and your governments to get approvals and permits. So um, that is where we are currently, is just looking at, again, where is the need as we transition and how do we play a role in making sure that everybody uh, can participate and especially has been mentioned, disadvantaged community members where we spend most of our time. And, and I, in the keynote, Regina spoke about um, some of the opportunities that might be available through four-year college or two-year college opportunities and then some through uh, uh, certificate programs and yeah. hands-on. So uh, did you want to speak a little bit about maybe the different approaches in terms of how you address those issues or the opportunities that you see and the different ways people can approach? Absolutely. I'm only going to answer whatever Tom asks because I told him I'm going to keep, I get long-winded, so I told him whatever he says, I'll just keep it within that that box. But so yeah, we, we tend to be more of like a boot camp style, right? We're not a two-year university. We're not a four-year university. They're amazing work being done in these places we don't need to replicate. Uh, we tend to work more with the non-traditional learner, people who don't seek out colleges as their first source of education, where they may not want to invest that level of time and energy because they don't really like school that much, or they're just not even sure if this is a path they want to go down until they've explored it, right? So being a more affordable resource, a more compact training, we partner with, obviously, you all, Department of Labor. Uh, we are an eligible training provider on the Department of Labor's list, so we can actually have individuals who meet the eligibility requirements um, take our training with the Department of Labor paying for it. We're heavily funded by NYSERDA, who pays for our trainings, um, and some of the other resources, the Department of Energy. And so we're able to train people for free and usually more of like 100-hour, 60 to 150-hour training, right? And so giving them exposure to 
the skill set. Um, we are partnering with some universities in which our programs upon completion would then transfer credits to them uh, to be able to get like a certificate program or even college credit. So within NYIT and SUNY Sullivan and some of the other schools that we're approaching. Um, and so looking at that as a model, but we tend to do, again, more of like a hyper-focused uh, boot camp, job readiness, like whatever you need to know to get entry level and then learn the rest as you would go. So I think there's room for all different aspects because some uh, roles are getting very technical. If you want to become an engineer, you can't do that in a you know, program with us. You need to go to school for a much longer period of time. But some of the work that you're seeing in like energy auditing and installation, you know, you may not need to spend quite so much. Uh, and before moving on to Julie, um, I know we had, we had discussed previously about the uh, uh, EV, the electric vehicle opportunities. Yeah. Do you want to just touch on that substantive area in terms of what you, you're you providing? Uh, sure. I mean, it was uh, interesting. I, 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 this is another area that's over my head. You'll, you'll know I'm like, the, I'm like the guy who knows just a little bit about everything, and then I have team members who are experts in a lot of things, right? Um, so EV is one where the demand is coming, right? In the next 10 years, there's mandates, right? As we talked about mandates where you will not be able to buy an imbus uh, internal combustion engine vehicle, right? You will be required if you're buying a new vehicle to buy an electric vehicle or some other form of alternative fuel. Hydrogen, I think, is coming soon. Um, and so as that transition happens, there needs to be places for people to charge. Not everybody has their own room to charge. So there's a need for charging stations to be at locations that are you know, readily available, places where people frequent schools and train stations and, and other places. So um, we provide a training that's focused on, again, looking at site feasibility and assessments for parking facilities and structures. And um, it's right now free to all New York State residents. Uh, it's a nine hour training, so it's not meant to be overly in depth, but to meant to give you a, an overview of, of the industry, what's happening and where you might fit in. There was a lot here about uh, capacity through the grid. And so that's gonna be a big thing for organizations that want to do installation of charging stations now or in the future. Um, in which there's something called future proofing, where if you're doing development, you need to cite a certain amount of electrical capacity for new installation of charging because that will be required. And so, um, you know, buying some of the, that capacity now when costs are lower and not being part of those those more expensive upgrades, I think those are all things that we're trying to navigate that conversation on. And so our training is really designed to help, you know, municipalities and governments, people who are overhauling and electrifying their fleet. Uh, people who uh, work, again, at large parking facilities and facilities management to think about where they're putting parking, how they're incorporating EV, and just being a part of that process. So that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. All right, great. Thank you. Um, and Julie, uh, in terms of what is uh, possible here at Pace University, um, talk a little bit about that and what you're, what, uh, you're focused on. Sure. Can everyone hear me? So hi everybody, I'm Julie Werkheiser. I am the Director of Continuing Education here at Pace University. And um, although at Pace University, we have our traditional undergraduate and graduate degrees, um, I'm responsible for the adult and continuing education. Um, you know, the person who's maybe been in the field for a little bit, little bit of time and wants to upskill a little, or it might be someone who's fresh out of high school, not really wanting to go to college, but maybe wanting to dip their foot into getting this specific skill. So we offer um, continuing education programs in um, construction project management, um, advanced blueprint reading, introduction to blueprint reading, intermediate blueprint reading, um, and also cost estimating. In addition to that, we have um, a project management preparation um, that students go through, and at the end, they take the, the Project Management Institute certification, um, and they complete that. Uh, the requirement for someone to attend any one of these programs that we offer is that you have um, a high school diploma and you're 18 years or older. I mean, what have you found uh, that, that students coming in we can cover this under the youth portion too, but but since you mentioned those those topics, are most interested in taking now. Has there been a change over the last there, you know several years? There actually has been. So um, during COVID, continuing education um, kind of went down. There was not a lot of interest in um, online continuing education. Now it's starting to take off a little bit more, and I would say we're seeing a big increase 
in the enrollment for construction project management for um, the beginner, intermediate, and advanced certificate for the blueprint reading. Um, and I think these are all skills people working in the field realize in order to move up, they need to get these skills. They don't necessarily need to get a college degree. So it's a much more affordable alternative for those of you all. All right, great. And next, Marvin, um, could you talk about two things? Um, uh, Comrie Enterprises and the mission of environmental leaders of COP. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Great. Um, well, first, I want to give you a little bit of background. Um, I've been working in the sustainability and energy field for over 25 years before it was fashionable. Um, now it's fashionable. Um, so today I'm going to represent talking about Adopt Clean Energy, which is a part of Conry Enterprises, and the environment leaders of color. Adopt Clean Energy is an ICERTA campaign to educate, encourage, and assist the Mount Vernon and New Rochelle residents with clean energy installs. The campaign funds are derived from heat pump installations, and the classes are for residents of these both of these two cities. Environment with the Color is a not-for-profit dedicated to educating and advocating for socially and economically vulnerable communities about climate change, its impact, mitigation, and solutions. So far, Environment Leaves the Color, or we call it ELOC, has focused on programs on with high school students to heighten their environmental awareness so they can choose environmental and clean energy fields for college and post-secondary careers. Our two programs we're focusing on right now are our Student Summer Energy and Environmental Program for Teens and our Technology and Environment advanced computer classes. We think those are very essential to move forward with our young people because young people have very short attention spans. <laughs> um, in our classes, when we work with the young people, we work with them about an hour and a half per class because again, very short attention spans. And if you don't keep people active and keeping them interested and engaging, you can forget about it, you lose them. So we've been working with that, even though I'm a little older than a lot of my, my students, uh, I try to learn from the students. Having a daughter 33 years old, you, you learn things that you didn't know before, um, and it's a challenge. <laughs> things have changed. And I try to go with those changes with the, where the young people and the environment is focusing towards. With our board that we have in Environment Lisa Color, if you look at our website, you will see I have members of our board throughout the United States. Why? Because each sector of minority areas and disadvantaged communities are very critical. I've worked, had the opportunity to work for 25 years in Africa, in the Caribbean, in the southern parts of the United States, and originally from New York, peak skill. So I've got the opportunity to, to learn all facets of around people around the world, how we view energy and sustainability around the world, as well as locally here in the United States. It's very critical that we look at those areas especially the young people, and even an old person like myself, I'm still learning a lot. <laughs> um, well, from one old person to the next, uh, let, me, um, <laughs> let me ask you about what you just said that, are, that I didn't hear before when we spoke in terms of uh, how people view sustainability here and around the world. So what did, what did you find? What were those differences? We're so behind here in the United States. Um, even in the Caribbean, people are looking to look at changes in how technologies advanced to help their their local communities. They're more community driven in, in places like Africa, parts of Africa, um, parts of the Caribbean. Um, it's very critical for them to keep moving forward and working as teams. We do not work as teams members here in the United States. If you look at the percentage of the folks um, around the world for energy and clean energy moving forward, we are so behind in the United States. We're like 2% of growth in the clean energy and sustainability field, while you look at Denmark, you look at other countries, are so far ahead of us. We have to catch up. We have to start working collectively together with our young people and our older folks like myself um, to move things forward, to collectively understand where we're going. So when we train young people with our focus on environmental of color, any student we feel that's capable of moving forward to go to college, we encourage that because it's critical that these young people have the ways of thinking differently and being able to motivate and own their own businesses. 
I come back, I come from the era of a gentleman who was my mentor when I was went to school in Atlanta, Georgia for my graduate degree, Maynard Jackson. The Maynard Jackson model was to move things forward, working together collectively with teams and partnerships with groups and organizations. And that's what we're all about with environments of color, as well as adopt clean energy. And let me, I mean, uh, Marvin, I maybe or maybe not went a little off script, so I'm going to a little off script and just say one thing about sustainable Westchester. Um, we've been working together on this on this summit, um, uh, and it's really my first opportunity to do that. But I want to say I've known Noam for a really long time, and to really have a visionary leader like Noam to be now the head of this organization is really important at this moment in time because, as you just said, if we're behind, we're not behind in Westchester because of the dedication of the county executive and sustainable Westchester and the leadership. It's, as I said in the beginning, it's really important that we recognize these partnerships and the panel that will follow. It's really important to sustain the partnerships in this field, which is really um, an unknown field changing by the minute. That is the most important thing. So for all of you who are employers and job seekers, this isn't the, the only time that you're gonna have this opportunity to, to connect with us. Um, uh, Tara is here from the community, we're from, uh, Westchester Community Foundation. There are a lot of great partners. Our, our mission is to make sure this dialogue continues and you're, uh, and for you to be a part of that. Um, so the last on the panel is, uh, is Erlen from IBW Local uh, 3, um, which has actually done an incredible amount of work on clean energy and renewable energy and the educational opportunities for their members. Um, and potential members. So if you would speak about that. Sure. Um, like I just mentioned, first, thank you for the invitation. Um, my name is Erwin Castillo. I'm the Associate Director of the Educational Cultural Trust Fund. I've been in this capacity for about two years now. Before that, I was just an electrician. Um, I went through the apprenticeship program. Uh, someone saw something in me and they tapped me and um, I go by a saying, too much is given, much is expected. So it's my turn to um, sort of do do what was done done for me. Just so want to just basically go over basically what we do in terms of training um, collectively within the building trade specifically, but specifically within local three. The building trades, um, the industry itself, not including the building trades, is like a, a trillion dollar uh, industry. About eight million workers. Of those eight million, about one million of them are unionized. That like. Um, Trade and tradesmen, which well, approximately 700,000 700, employers. Um, but then the building trades, in terms of an investment into training, we're only second to the Department of, of Defense. So collectively, all the all the trades, we, we pour in billions of dollars into training, only so we could be at the cutting edge of training. That way, as these new technologies come in, we could train our workers and the partnership that we have with our employers, we could always move the, that agenda forward. Um, a lot of times they mentioned the gold standard, which is the apprenticeship model. Um, it predates any any legislation that has supported it. I mean, some of the founding fathers were, were apprentices. Um, but that's sort of the gold standard, what we have. Um, and it's pretty much you work your way into the middle class. I know it's it's done amazing for me. Um, and it's done for thousands of, of other, other people within the trades. Specific to... Um, IBW local local unit number three. It's about twenty eight thousand members. Um, Thirteen of them being in the construction and other and then there's other divisions of admin workers, um, project managers, estimators, all supported and, and fall into into these different collective bargaining units. Um, training inside local three falls into three main buckets. You have safety, the safety department. You have the apprentice department and then the department I'm coming out of, the Education and Cultural Trust Fund. Um, See, so the department is paramount um, at the turn of the century. In fact, that's why a bunch of workers, electricians got together to form uh, the IBEW. Mortality rate at the turn of the century was about one in, one in, one in two, basically 50% of all electricians were, were getting hurt or, on the, or, or were just not making it home. So, um, it's very much ingrained into the fabric of what we are as as an institution. Um, you know, there's there's uh, sort of uh, sayings every member has to need to go home or think of the next guy. These are these are stuff that are ingrained in our members. Whether you're a project manager, an estimator, or an apprentice, we also have five registered apprenticeship programs with the Department of Labor. Uh, the most popular one is the New York uh, the New York City 
uh, journey person. Uh, we have one in Westchester. We have building maintenance, the DVM, the lineman, which works on the transmission cable and the elevator maintenance. Um, the apprenticeship is typically about 8,000 on the job hours that you go out there and you're just working, learning the trade. And as that's complemented by um, some theory-based training after, after, after work. Um, our apprentices also get an associate's degree. It's part of the curriculum of one of the reasons why our business manager, Christopher Erickson, could manage or negotiate um, these decent wages for us is because his, his, he's negotiating on behalf of a professional workforce. Um, so that, that's important. Education Cultural Trust Fund, which is the department I, I currently work out of, um, basically once you become a, an electrician or register with the state, you want to upskill, you want to hone your skills, you want to work on the road, you want to get your CDL, you want to work offshore, you want to do renewable energy, you'll come to my department and we'll we'll finance it all, we'll give you the training, we'll give you the certificates, um, and basically it's it's there for you to 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 succeed. Aside from that, we we have a, a a tuition reimbursement plan for our members. We have people getting PhDs unrelated to being electricians. Uh, lawyers, some come to the law school here. Um, we also have a scholarship program that we're actually having this uh, this Saturday over a million dollars in scholarships to the children of Local 3. So training and education is sort of the cornerstone of what we do um, in the building train, specific, but specifically in Local 3. And one of the things in that workforce uh, conference that I mentioned that, that all the presenters emphasized was the importance of apprenticeship programs. And and frankly, the fact that it's not as widely known um, that these opportunities are available, um, and not just directly through unions, some in the private sector, but but certainly IBW um, has been a leader in the apprenticeship movement really for many years. So is um, or when you try to uh, solicit those to come into the program, what is the approach that you use? You know, How do you explain how valuable that is versus other means of entering the job market. Well, we 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 partner with um, with a couple of nonprofit organizations, um, direct entry for organizations that that sort of offset a lot of our demand. So because we are, you know, we, we have this uh, registered apprenticeship program in the Department of Labor, they were sort of mandating that as they should to have these these quotas. Uh, like I, a good example I use a lot is, you know, we have an affirmative action plan of like seven to ten percent. Of women to be coming, we we exceed that. We're like at fourteen, almost almost fifteen percent. Why? Because we partner with this organization, non traditional employment for women. They pretty much a pipeline. Anytime we need we need to increase our numbers, we we go to we go to non traditional employment for women. We also have one for uh, war veterans, for helmets and hard hats. We have another one for uh, NYCHA residents. But they live in New York City public housing. Uh, high school seniors in, in New York City public schools. So we have a robust network that we've used that we've uh, developed over 100 years being in New York City uh, to really, really get the um, the membership to reflect what a, what a typical commute to New York City would look like. And just one other question uh, that may apply to everybody, but in terms of upskilling um, into the clean or renewable energy field, are you finding that some of your members may have had training in HVAC, for example, but if they want to go into solar energy uh, as a solar energy installer or other related field, are they coming for those opportunities as well? And I think the beauty of, of our, at least the Education Culture Trust Funds, is really demand-driven. If you want to be more employable, you'll get the skills that you need. Uh, when we were unveiling uh, some EV charging uh, curriculum, um, and there was this uh, third party called EVITP. Lots of people went came to us. We're in the mix of soliciting a federal grant to build this offshore wind training facility in in, in Newburgh. Um, and just just to get feelers, our business manager Christopher Erickson had a, had an open house, and we thought we'd have like 100 people. It was standing room only, 500 people. We had to move at chairs. So the demand is there, the need is there, and I think it. Forms like this is important to build awareness and 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 hopefully spark interest. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and this isn't exactly we have time, so uh, we're going to leave time for questions. But so this isn't exactly a lightning round, but just briefly, um, 
uh, in terms of the more youth focus, and some of you did address this already, but um, I certainly know Dwayne has a lot to say about your activities through youth, but I, I know that you've worked with us in Career Pathways, and you've partnered, I think, with uh, New Rochelle and um, Booker T. Washington schools, who are specifically uh, dedicated to youth uh, services. So if you want to speak about those opportunities. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, there's a lot, obviously, that's happening, and I think the youth are very active um, in understanding what's happening with climate change, and they're part of that that uh, that voice that's moving us into action. And so having them be aware of where these job opportunities are, I think is paramount, right? Being aware of these union opportunities is, is important. And I don't know if that gap is being met as, as quickly as we'd like, right? For them to know that there's pathways that are alternative to universities, there are opportunities that exist um, in this clean energy and, and uh, green economy. And so we run programs um, also with schools. So we are brought into some of the, the middle schools and high schools to perform programming. We also partner with some of our nonprofit organizations that work with young adults. So at a middle school, high school level, a lot of it is more introductory career exploration. So they are learning again about some of the different pathways. They might get an introduction to hand tools and power tools through my team here. They may do some small build outs and like minor projects. Uh, they may do some type of recycling projects, some light electrical, learn about energy efficiency in that way. So it's a little introductory, but again, just to expose them to what are some of the pathways. Um, we work a lot with young adults in that 16, 18 to 24 year old demographic. Um, and a lot of the work that we do with Tom and Liz um, is really focused on uh, educating that demographic, again, around the career pathways, but giving them much more of a tailored skill set. So, I, um, you know, the demand in, in the installation lane is huge, right? So the work that IBW and some of the partners are doing really focus around installation. You have a lot of EV charging that needs to go on the ground. You have a lot of uh, air source heat pumps that need to go into the ground or into the buildings. You have solar. A lot of those are electrical skill sets. A lot of those are, you know, again, trades level skills. Um, and so we're um, providing those at a, at a level that I think is, again, aligned with where we see work. Um, so from middle school, high school and above, I think, you know, our youth programs are, are again, imperative for us actually meeting some of the goals that we have because we have a whole generation that wants to be involved that isn't always sure how to. Um, and then the youth bureaus have been another huge uh, partner for us kind of across the board. So looking for more of those types of collaborations as we go forward. And I, I mean, and in many areas, of course, youth are often ahead of the adults in, uh, in, in political and societal consciousness about a lot of things. But I'm just wondering, and we haven't discussed this, so uh, I'll ask you now though, anyways. Um, have you noticed like in the last couple of years, there's a change in the awareness of even young people in terms of the opportunities in clean and renewable energy versus even two or three years ago? Is that something you... I, I would say so. I mean, I think there's still a disconnect. I think the, the the language is becoming more commonplace, right? Things around climate change and carbon emissions and greenhouse gas and just some of the terminology. But as far as the specifics of pathways, I think there's still a lot of education that can be done. So I don't think they know exactly where they can participate. The desire to be involved and to have an impact, very much there, right? That That is not going away, but I think the specifics and nuance and I think it became very clear to us at the at the height of the pandemic, um, we had been funded by NYSERDA to run our Clean Energy Academy. That I mentioned before, we do a partnership with Con Edison, Will Dan, um, some other partners. And um, height of the pandemic, or really April of 2020, we had to transition to online. And we had just developed a partnership with New York Institute of Technology. So even a very well-known, respected institution um, was sending their students to us right, from their energy management master's program, their electrical engineering and other programs to learn about these specific pathways because there was still a gap even there around how do you connect and partner, again, to understand the clean energy ecosystem that exists here in New York. So Con Ed has specific programs, specific job roles that are, again, very administrative in nature, so not always in the field, but then the auditing practices, the energy modeling, just being able to kind of condense it to what's happening day to day on the ground from, again, a utility and then all the subcontracted partners of what are the skill sets that they want to hire for today and tomorrow. And so I think that gap is still needed to kind of bridge where our, our young people are to just prepare them for, for some of that real world work. Okay, great. And and uh, yeah, just, yeah, please go. So um, what I just want to highlight, we just started this about a, a month ago. We recently won a, a grant, this ecosystem grant with this uh, offshore wind developer called Equinor. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And we uh, we partnered with some a VR company, and we're actually going into inner city schools. Uh, we have them come into our training center, and we put on some VR goggles, and it's sort of, sort of surreal experience 
of um, being offshore. Um, we've read a lot of stuff that in order for you to get this pipeline of, of hundreds of thousands, even millions of workers that are going to be needed with this new economy, you need, but you're heading them by high school, it's already too late. You have to get them in grade school or younger where they start provoking uh, or get this interest into 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 the trades and, and the benefits of being one member. And, and actually, we do have a, I believe in the, when we go upstairs, we do have a VR um, goggle for geothermal specifically. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not uh, under 18, you would enjoy it. I think. <laughs> yes, Marvin, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to let you know, since we started our program with Environmental Use of Color, we started in 2021. Um, we've graduated over 300 students just for this summer. And this summer, we're expecting, and we got work throughout the county of Westchester, um, we're expecting over 200 students this summer. Um, and we've been asked to go into Nassau, Suffolk, and even parts of New Jersey with our program. My wife is just on our television program will be on Sunday. She's been filming today, so we've been talking about our program, and how, how we're making an impact in Westchester, how we're making an impact in other parts of the country. So we're again, we're looking for partnerships and collaborations with people in within our county. We're looking for people to we can work with that can see our vision because we started working with the young people who were environmental activists that were people of color because it was essential. And they told me and my wife, Dr. Dr. Diane Williams, that they didn't see enough programming for our community. So that's why we started Environment Use of Color because there was no programming in the major cities throughout Westchester County for the minority communities, period. Um, so we started that, and some of those young people that we worked with at that time are now owning their own companies, working at other not-for-profits, and they're great visionaries that we really appreciate right now. But we see with a lot of young people, if you give them an opportunity and a chance, you'd be surprised how brilliant they are. They are so brilliant. We ha with our program, I'll just make this last point. We were in all the major cities in Westchester. We have a science fair that comes to culminates all together, and we have about maybe two or three hundred students in one room of all of color. But we encourage other organizations to get involved with us. We would love to do that. But to see the brilliance of these young people, to see the creativity of these young people, to see that they, they've been lost vision and opportunities because nobody took attention to them. It's so critical. And when you can relate to a young person and relate to people in college, and, and we have college interns working with all along, so working and supporting our students, and also we have facilitators who are educators that are supporting our students who have PhDs and master's degrees teaching our children, those things are very critical. So I'm reaching out to if anybody's an educator, if anybody has vision to want to work with young people, Please see me after this program. I have my card to so be more than happy to do that because it's critical. We have to encourage moving forward, working with our young people because that's our future. And if we don't expect that, especially on the education front, we're in trouble. Young people, like I said, they have a very short attention span. But when you engage them and you encourage them, and I will encourage you, I will invite you to hopefully you'll come to our program this summer. We, last summer, we had the president of Mars Wrigley speaking to our kids. They have a huge sustainability program at their corporate, he's head of North America. Before that, I had the associate general counsel for Microsoft to head our program. I bring in top leaders from around the country so young people can see they can be there too. It's critical that we have to have visions because in corporate America, I've, I've been there, there's, there's not a lot of people that look like me in those corporations and those not-for-profits. We have to start merging, bringing people together Co cooperating, working together collectively. Maybe you haven't heard of me, but I've been around quietly, <laughs> let me tell you, because it's very important. We need to focus. We need everybody's hands on deck to help, and I'm, I'm reaching out to everybody today. Thank you. Yep. And, um, and before we open it up for questions, I was going to ask uh, Julie, she may have touched on this on the Summer Scholars. It also occurred to me, you know, we keep talking with unions and other approaches to uh, to work, you know, alternatives to four-year colleges. We happen to be at a four-year college, so we, we don't mean to discourage anybody from taking that path. I think what's recently been discussed, you know, in the workforce community is just simply to allow people to be aware of different paths to get to where they want to go. 
um, one doesn't certainly preclude the other, and um, and pace is such an important piece of it. Yeah. Um, so I know there's a lot of job seekers seekers here, but there's also a lot of employers here. Um, part of what I do also is build relationships with corporations um, to identify skills that their workforce needs. Um, so right now we're working with um, Regional Alliance. I don't know if you've ever heard of Regional Alliance. Um, and, and we supply the instructor to the company and they deliver the blueprint reading or the construction project management or whatever skills that they have a need for. So we may not have the course advertised or the skill advertised that you're particularly looking for, but we welcome the opportunity to customize or um, develop it. And we've recently um, started offering micro-credentials, which are a big hot topic um, and big among the um, youth. So we've started offering those as well. Good. Uh, how about a hand for our, for our panelists? And um, we have a couple minutes before um, the uh, job fair portion starts. City. Commend all of you for being leader. Later. So, um, we do a five year program for our apprenticeship. So, let's talk about how this year, which great work at talks, where how on the ADS is going to be looking at where I was getting my bid, moving it well. Um, I have the PCO, your hometown, and also the McKinley Street. I offer anybody who wants to come to visit our union hall. It is in uh, 1024 McKinley Street. And we, you know, basically, again, we have pathways that we try to become part of the community. A lot of these jobs, if they're going to go, they can sign project labor agreements, and the unions would have a good opportunity because the, if with the unions, we're basically a living wage. All the companies they're much lower i think a lot of times too what changed a lot that you got rid of pensions because now people jump from one job to the next just for a dollar yet you know so if they came back into pensions people would be opted to stay more with the company or something like that 401ks just keep jumping from one company to the other and you outlive them so we basically set up a, a standard there the education is very important safety is very important and we want, the more jobs we have, the more we can grow the unions. And we get the politicians that come into us now a lot more. We do job fairs. The problem there is the kids just walk around. They have no clue. And I think we got to get back into having the shops in schools, you know, and the guidance counselors have to be educated on what the trades actually offer. It's rewarding to work with your hands. I'm first generation. I worked my way all the way up to the business manager of Local 21 with 1,200 members. That's basically it. Back you again. If I, if I could just answer that to this band, thank you. Um, and, and he's right, like in my initial comments, I was I talked about that there's eight, eight million, um, eight million construction workers in this industry of those eight million, only one, one million are. If our market share was bigger, then we would we would have a higher, 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 um, membership, you know, we're not in the business of training when there's no job at the end. We're, we're in the business of training and providing you a job, not only a job, but a job with dignity, a job that gives you a pension, a job that can give you a lifestyle, a sustaining lifestyle where you could be in the middle class. Training that and then you left at the end is not something we're invented. So he's absolutely right. The elected officials and the community at large are active or engaging the unions and saying, listen, yes, these should be unionized jobs, then instead of being 1 million of, of 8 million, we could be 8 million of 8 million. No, I was just going to say, well, we're fortunate to, to partner with the uh, Peace Skill Youth Bureau, and they like to run more of these types of programs, and we're training them to a standard. As I said, you know, we're not doing a larger kind of apprenticeship model but I do feel like the individuals who take part in our trainings would like to be able to find that feeder program. And if we're training them 100, 200 hours, hopefully they, again, they're ideal candidates for what you'd be looking for. And I'd love to find a way to collaborate and, and um, you know, have you connect deeper to the, the programming that they run and see where that, con that collaboration could lie. So thank you. Yes. 
I just want to, you know, build upon that. Apprenticeship is higher education. So really, it's not just about the schools and the individuals and the, the guidance counselors. It's us as a community, really uplifting those who work in the trades and everybody saying, well, that'd be nice for somebody else's kid to do that, but not my kid. My kid's going to middle four year college. So it's really about shifts in societal norms and what we believe and what we uplift. So I just want to put that out there. We're pro BOCI, so very dedicated to putting trades in the schools, supporting the unions. Also, lifelong, my entire family are IBEW and UA members. Um, so it's not just about the schools. It's about us as a society and really uplifting these opportunities and really honoring a living wage for people to have lifelong career. So just want to add that. That was, that was the uh, aforementioned Tracy Rasica, who's, as I mentioned, a member of our board. So thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Liz Oliver. Yes. I had no idea. Better if you should stand up so some people can hear you in the back. I've always had that wrong. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, but keep asking me, right? Yeah. All right. How much of the classes that are like the micro classes? So micro credentials are free to pay students. Okay. Um, so if you're a matriculated student at Pace, it's free. Um, if we're working with a particular industry, um, we work with that industry to develop the price. So it could range anything from you know a hundred dollars all the way up to maybe ten thousand dollars. So. Currently, we have a micro-credential program with White Plains Hospital. It's called the Health Law and Policy uh, Certificate Program. And that's a more expensive program because we took existing curriculum that the law school has, we repurposed it, and we're delivering at the White Plains Hospital just the skills that they need. So that's a little bit. It's the average duration. Uh, it depends. It depends on the curriculum, depends on the content. Um, for the ones that I mentioned earlier, like construction project management, blueprint reading, things like that, um, those classes range in price anywhere from five ninety five up to the highest one being eighteen hundred dollars, and they're all four week courses that meet in the evenings usually. What I plan to say is, Marvin did go to Soul Synergy and get the uh, like the beginning of what they need, and then end up you. Yep. Yeah, we then you go for like, Well, I, we I'll, talked about a partnership I here. That you one thing yeah, I will say to I you, agree. one thing I'll say to you, yeah. in the especially in the disadvantaged community, we have to look at educational training. Work is very critical for families, but we have to start educating young people's minds. We have to encourage young people to want to be in their own businesses to move forward. It's nothing wrong with starting out in the career of working. In, in in the industry as IBW or other the other uh, unions, but traditionally we have not been successful in the union trades. Uh, let's be honest with each other. We want to be successful. We we want to move forward, but we don't see people that look like myself in those key positions who are getting there now that they weren't there before. So you don't have a trend, you don't see the, the vision, young people don't see the vision, they don't see the opportunities, but they're seeing that now because there's other leaders now coming forward within the unions. And I'm glad that's happening now. So Wayne and I've talked, I have my training program that we work well together. If I need, if my kids aren't available, I should refer to Wayne, we've done that. So we do, we do collaborations, we do that right now. But my focus right now, knowing that my father didn't finish high school, and was denied the opportunities of getting a home after World War II. My focus to helping young people look like me and other brown, black and brown young people to look for the opportunities to get there. Because America has not been fair to Amer certain peoples of, of, of our, 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 our people in America. But now we have to be fair. We want to have, create opportunities, but we have to open that door. And I'm the kind of person, and you haven't met my wife. <laughs> She's quiet, but she carries a big stick. And she's much more eloquent than I am. But at the same time, and I have to give credit, I have to go home. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to start working together more collectively. We don't. I've been, I worked in county government here in Westchester. Great opportunities. I worked in state government opportunities. I worked in um, around corporate industry and corporate corporation corporations. 
I've seen the whole gym of everything. So I've learned to learn to cooperate with people that can cooperate with me. I try to open that door as best as I can. But if I don't, that door is not open. I do what we have to do to move things forward. So I'm here together to learn. I don't know everything. I'll tell you that right now. But we have to start working collectively together. We really do. I mean, like I said, I grew up in Peekskill. I live in Mount Vernon. I, I, we have programs. I We've covered, but I, th I think, three-fourths of the youth girls in Westchester County are working with our programs. And we opened that door. But I'm telling you, that if, one, if, you, if you have the opportunity to invite, I invite you to our program for the summers, you will be so proud to see young people, the creativity of these young people, the imagination of these young people that we have not given them a chance in traditional education, and for them to think out of the box and not be kind of stymied of saying, this is the way you got to learn, because everybody learns differently. And Dwayne will tell you that all the time. They learn differently. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Deb Novick, who uh, runs the entrepreneurial programs for the county executive's office. Entrepreneurship. They don't skip that. Or they gone through all those wonderful training programs and we're granted to go out around. So we have cyber back away, kind of like another way to add box. Um, our floor external program is a craft station right now to go almost like that. I've never heard of it. So I'll provide a family call so I can go with fully ready for what this president needs. So if anybody has problems in the past last year, ended up the ground, started the business, go to more slow than the other day, hope you were in more touch, look at it, a little help together and actually do that. Well, I'll thank you for coming. I'm going to get to the first meeting. I'll let it be so the boss. Thanks for the tips. And I, I was wondering if you, uh, any, in your work, have any steering with character generation through waste disposal as we lead to the society of the incinerators, uh, which is also sort of presented as green energy coming from soft fabric society. Next slide. I'm wondering if anything you have in work with that they can pass in waste disposal or in the generation from waste disposal, especially as it's usually cited in the I think, I think Marvin does have something to say, but I do also want to encourage you to come back for the uh, panel in a half hour because. Or is it now? An hour, an hour. Because in an hour, uh, because that that panel is going to focus on particular opportunities such as that. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, I will let you know. Um, coming from Peekskill, being from Peekskill, I presented a proposal to the city council in the city of Peekskill for a how to deal with the, the that Indian Point area as well as Charles Point. And we came up with solutions of how to do that. And I was working with the Kennedy family to assist me with my proposal but it didn't work out through the city council. Um, so Dr. Williams and I are very good friends. I've known her for quite a while who lives in Peekskill. So I've collectively tried to work with folks that are traditionally are out, out of the box thinkers, look at the health hazards and, and issues, because that's been going on since I've been, I grew up in Peekskill. So yes, I we came up with some solutions and ideas, but at the time the city council did not agree. Did you have Yes, hi. My name is Tracy Jones. Um, uh, thank you all for a very informative session. Um, I also, I too came, uh, I'm a founder. I came through one of uh, my business, went through one of the uh, Westchester County Business Accelerators, Element 46, that Deborah oversees. That okay. so was awesome. Um, I have a question, I believe, for um, Dwayne and, and, and Irvin. Just uh, in terms of data, you train lots of people who come through your, your, your programs, your training, how many of those training or those training opportunities end up in direct uh, employment placement? Do you have, sure. can you talk yeah. about that a little? For sure. Uh, so I'll speak, speak about the Clean Energy Academy. This is the Clean Energy Summit. Um, we have trained just over a thousand people in that training program since uh, 2020. Well, 2019, it was funded by our first cohort launch 2020. Um, we get about almost 50-50 between job seekers and incumbents, right? So people who are already employed looking to upskill and they may be working in the industry or maybe working in other industries. 
um, and trying to get transition. And then we get about the other half who are fully unemployed and, and don't have uh, career prospects. For those who are actively looking for employment, um, our job placement outcomes are right around 76% at the moment. Um, we have, I would say, about 60 to 70% of those who are Black and uh, black African American, about another 20 plus percent that are Hispanic, and then the remainder are kind of a mix between Caucasian, Native American, et cetera. Um, we have a decent number who come to us without formal education. So most of who we're getting also don't have like four-year degrees. We're getting a lot of people who have high school diplomas, high school equivalencies, and others. Um, we're finding a lot of the job placement, again, our training is geared towards energy auditing as a skill set. So that is our primary kind of skill or technical skill that we're training on, how to perform level one and, and level two energy audits on, again, lighting, HVAC, heat pumps, et cetera. And so we're seeing people move into auditing as a role, but also into outreach, business development. So sales, if you have that kind of background, a lot into um, inspections and a lot into project coordination and project management. Those are a lot of the lanes in which we're seeing. We do see people going to more like facilities management or working with VMS systems. We do see some people going to installation, but since that class is a little bit more virtual, unless you come to us with a hands-on skill to do installs, we wouldn't be preparing you in that lane. So we do try to have our programs even be feeders into each other. So the programs that we run that are more construction focused, try to send them to our Clean Energy Academy to learn the rest of how the, the trade skills inter intersect and overlap with some of the, the clean energy um, retrofitting work that needs to be done. So um, that's essentially what we've been able to see through our programs. Because NYSERDA funds us, we are required and proud to be able to recruit primarily from disadvantaged communities and priority populations as our, our objective. And, um, you know, as I said, we train anywhere across the state and we do train individuals for those variety of career pathways. So, so far, um, mid seventies, to almost 80% job placement outcomes and working across those different verticals. But I'll say none of that would be possible without the partnerships. So if we didn't have a partnership with Con Edison, right, as a local utility who oversees millions of dollars of incentives, if we didn't work with Wildan who oversees and implements the energy efficiency programs like the clean heat program, the small media business program, the multifamily energy efficiency program, and then working with their subcontractor networks, it would be a harder thing to facilitate. So again, knowing where the jobs are and what the employers are looking for, and then designing a program in line with that need is a big part of how we've been able to navigate that space. So I'll answer your question. We've been training mostly, especially Mount Vernon New Rochelle, I've been focusing on some of the existing businesses that do not have the trained workforce because a lot of the workforce is not trained. They don't have the licenses. So what I've been doing is focusing on those underserved community businesses that do not have, they have the business, they have the, the, the experience, but they don't have the certifications and they don't have the infrastructure to move forward with the employees. So we've been training employees for them, training them themselves because some of them don't, some certifications go back to maybe 2001, and they haven't been trained to be upgraded to know what's going on in, in the industry of ground and air source heat pumps. So that's what we focus on. Also, what I've been doing is that, and I don't talk about it that much, but we'll be hopefully launching that pretty soon. We started working with the um, Clean Energy Network in Mount Vernon. And right now we're looking at the corridors of Mount Vernon East Corridor and the downtown corridor that was a U10 project, which is part of the utilities for Con Edison, but Con Ed didn't pick our project. So we're combining those two projects to re 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 revitalize downtown Mount Vernon to a green energy economy using thermal district systems. So I don't talk about it that much. You hear about it in the newspaper. I like get stuff done. I'm the kind of person, get stuff done first and advertise it later. So our percentage of getting people to work, it's been about 50%. I'm the kind of person that goes back to the, the, the era where people would always get, receive the money and not get the people to work. If, if I see that's go, going in that direction, I don't participate because it's not about money for me, my, my wife and I. It's about making sure people get trained, people have the opportunity, because that's how we grow our businesses. If we don't start again, as I repeat, to growing our businesses, because it's very difficult for us when we earn business to be in business because we don't get the unique opportunities others do. So I try to collaborate as much as I can, but if I don't see a direction going there that's, that the opportunities open that door, I leave it alone, I won't pursue it because I'm not gonna waste taxpayer money or our money at all to move forward. So that's how, how I operate. Thank you.
Thank you so much.